Hi, my name is Zach Buchanan. My name is Marshall Hutchings. Welcome to Scientist Talk Movies. Marshall, do you want to talk a little bit about what got you into science? Yes. So I, I've just always been interested in math and science. And when it came to deciding a major in undergrad, I sort of bounced around for a while in different science-related majors and then took a chemistry class. And it just made a lot of things make sense that Priestley didn't. It was just interesting things to think about. And that, that solidified it for me. And I'm now in, my, uh, in a PhD program here at UC Davis studying computational chemistry. What about you? Yeah, so I, I, I too, I'm also always kind of been interested in science and math. That's kind of where I leaned towards. And I was lied to in elementary and middle and high school. And, you know, you either go into writing or you go into science and math, which there are a lot of other options. And those two actually aren't really all that exclusive from each other, which is kind of obnoxious. But... It's fine. It's fine. Um, but I, I took, I took, I actually took a couple of chemistry classes in high school. I took normal chemistry and AP chemistry. Um, but I remember being in chemistry as my sophomore year and like everyone thought it was the super, super hard subject. Like all my friends that were in the class with me and they were like always complaining about it. And it just made sense to me. And I was like, Oh, maybe this is what I should do. Like chemistry is not that bad. I'm pretty good at it. Maybe I should, I should do that. Um, so fast forward, I went to college and I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor, but that was not right. Uh, cause I don't like biology all that much and, um, I'm not a huge fan of dealing with strangers. So like that kind of are two of things that you need, need as a doctor. If I don't end up going to medical school, chemistry seems like a good fallback for me. Like I, something I like doing, um, I find it interesting and I think I can probably find a job doing something along those lines. So that's what I did for college. And then later on, I, I you know, met a grad student and I learned, he, he was explaining to me that when he went to grad school, that's when <laughs> learning became fun again. And so that kind of was like, oh, I love, I like learning. I kind of want it to be fun. You know, you, you're interested in a topic, you go and just study that topic on your own and figure it out or find a class. And that's kind of how I ended up in grad school is I, really liked chemistry and I liked learning things. So that's why I'm here. I like tinkering with stuff. So I joined a brand new lab so that I could build a new instrument um, that's never been used before or made before. So uh, that's what I do now is I've spent the last five years trying to build this instrument and get it working and, and develop new techniques for doing some interesting science and astrochemistry. Are there any recent movies that have caught your eye as far as the science they talk about? I mean, we were talking about Ant-Man the other day, kind of how it's not great science, but kind of inter interesting that they like almost have some concepts right when it's convenient. You said you just watched that one, right? Yeah, and it is just a great movie. And I'm not usually one to like nitpick for science. I usually treat a movie like sort of like a roller coaster ride just to enjoy it. But mm -hmm. I tried to watch it with a little more critical eye and... You know, there, there is some decent science in there, but like you said, it does go off the rails sometimes. A lot of times. Yeah. The, the, thing, the thing that kills me about Ant-Man is like their, their argument on, you know, you have the same mass when you shrink down. So like you hit just as hard as a grown man would, except, you know, this tiny little pinprick. But like they don't translate that to him standing on the back of ants or riding on the back of a flying ant or... That was one thing that they were pretty inconsistent with because they they really hit hard, you know, that it was supposed to be like the same mass. Therefore, he was just a very dense little person. And they're, so like the initial scene where he first shrinks, the bathtub water hits him, knocks him all the way out of the bathtub. <laughs> and then Forgot as he's falling, that. he's then all of a sudden dense enough to start punching through various floors in his apartment building. I'm like, wait, he's light enough for a splash of water to knock him like three feet, but then heavy enough to punch through solid wood. And it was. Or like he's jumping at the door, trying to get through the keyhole, but doesn't go through the wood jumping at it. And like, you know, like you said, you talked about the ants carrying him around, you know, like I know ants can lift 
you know, very immense weights, but that would have been incredible feet to right, carry well, him around. Well, and I've, I've stepped on an ant with like my normal size foot and it doesn't fare so well usually. Oh, you, you didn't like surf it? No, afterwards. although I have had a dream. I did have a dream once where a swarm of ants came onto my bed and picked me up and started carrying me away, which I think has led to my lifelong fear of ants, but. That also happened in an episode of MacGyver, you know, oh. so like there's like a, they fought the ants and they were like warring with them. And did you watch a lot of MacGyver? I've never really seen it. I, I caught a handful of episodes. I wasn't like a fanatic or anything, but just, it was just sort of just a, a fun, interesting show. And that there's a lot of wacky sort of pseudoscience that happened yeah, in that. I was going to ask about the science because he like, I see, I see the jokes about it, you know, like with this paper clip and this, you know, grape, I can build a hand grenade that'll get us out of this situation or, you know, whatever the jokes are. One, one of the episodes he uses water in like a cold rock he pours in a crack so the water freezes and then cracks like a boulder off to like smash a car and that actually is sort of similar to what happens in ant-man because mm -hmm. uh to crack the safe he pour he fills it with water and then he pours a bunch of liquid nitrogen into it to freeze the water and then you know expand it and i don't know exactly how much water and how much liquid nitrogen you would need to pull it off but i thought that was like some cool chemistry that they showed at work yeah and i've definitely forgotten sodas in the freezer before and experienced that effect in action in my own life um to kind of disastrous results does it freeze and then burst or is it sort of like mm, well it kind of like becomes a slushy almost okay because usually what i do you know is you stick it in the ice bin of the freezer and then pull it out a short time later but if you forget to, then all of your ice becomes like soda flavored slushy ice instead. So it's not all bad. No, I mean, if you're into that. One thing I wanted to ask you about. So one of the, I guess, technologies or powers in Ant-Man is like the, the ant mind control. What, what did you <laughs> think about that? It was, it was so hand wavy. They didn't even try and like make it scientific. I don't think like they're like, yes, we have this device and it is a black box that lets us control the ants and it's like oh yeah okay if you played like real-time strategy games like age of empires or starcraft how hard it is, is it to like control it. all the units and get them to actually do what you want it to i was like man they must be like really good at these like real-time strategy games i didn't even think about that <laughs> yeah i don't i have so many idle workers all the time you know you're trying to like get them to start you know chopping logs or getting gold for you <laughs> But if they were directly interfaced to your brain, could you like maybe notice that they're idle? I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, we just go wait for the technology to come to our personal PCs to interface with those games. You know, well, like I'm sure it's coming soon. This seems like a neuroscience experiment. You know, they they need to like develop one of those head caps with all the wires on it. Yeah. But, and then and then design you know Age of Empires like that somehow. Maybe couple it with. VR so that you're like totally immersed and oh and like you could have like a thousand windows that show you all of your different workers views. I think the micromanaging would be really hard you know like controlling a hundred different things to work and like you know that is pretty complicated. What they should have done is they should have like been like yes we have this thing that lets you network with this neural AI <laughs> you know like AlphaGo or something that controls the ants and you just kind of set the tasks and then we've got artificial machine intelligence that makes sure that it's happening and alerts you when things aren't going on. There you go. That would work. Right. That's, prob that, that's probably how the technology worked. Right? Yeah. They just had to cut that part. Right. I, for, I assume. For, for, for <laughs> that actually reminds me of our, our conversation. I was probably a year or two back when we realized that we shouldn't be movie directors because 95% of the movie would be explaining the science behind it. And you'd get like, Three, three minutes of plot is all out of movie and people wouldn't like that. For we did come to that realization. Yeah, it would be more like a science class and then credits, <laughs> no action, <laughs> nothing would happen. I mean, like it works for some movies, The Martian and there's that scene in Apollo 13 where people are okay with you just explaining stuff. But I think people like the action as well for some reason. True. I love the Thomas the Tank Engine fight in Ammon. Like that was... I think one of the highlights of the movie. I forgot about that part. 
And that's another one where the density questions come into play. It's like, uh -huh. you know, a two ounce Thomas engine is running into them when they're supposed to weigh like 150, 200 pounds. And doesn't it, doesn't it crush a police car when it gets grown up really big? I think it smashes through a wall, something like that. I could see it smashing through a wall. Like if you've got something small that gets big all of a sudden, but the crush in the car again is kind of an issue. So want to know something interesting I was thinking about when I'm watching that movie. Um, I'm like, wow, like there's sort of, there's some parallels to the movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids here. You know, one, like, they're both Disney properties. You got that. And then there's- that, end of, Was Ant-Man Disney when it was made? Yeah. Or was it? Okay. They end up writing ants at some point. They shrink by reducing the empty space within atoms. And, you know, it's like, like there are some parallels there. They just they just ripped off Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Yeah, maybe it was like a reboot. You know, we just stealth reboot. So the, the science in that movie is not great either, right? Because we run into all the same ignoring. But that is where I learned that bananas have a lot of potassium in them. And so that's kind of stuck with me in my whole life. So there is some good science, you know, a little nutritional science in there. Yeah, life lessons. <laughs> Did you have other movies, Marshall? I have a little bit more on Ant-Man. Maybe I went too much of a deep dive on that, but um, <laughs> like, super so, deep. Did you take notes? You know, you got your notebook out. Uh, so, <laughs> the personal protective equipment of the workers in uh, Pym Labs didn't seem quite up to standard. They were like trying to shrink the lamb, and they kept like dying. And I don't think they even had goggles on. You know, I, I would have sent them back to their apartment to go change, you know, to appropriate protective equipment. So. <laughs> go get your closed toed shoes on and exactly. don't come back without it. Yeah, no, no safety glasses. You have safety goggles in this lab. That, that is a really good point, though. Like the, the, sa the personal protective equipment in real science versus movie science. Like, I mean, obviously they're just props, but I feel like, you know, you've been cast as a scientist. Here's your lab goat and maybe you're wearing a you know, button up shirt and a tie. Whereas like most real scientists I know are jeans and t-shirt and they only wear a lab coat if they're going to spill something on themselves. Yes. I don't think I've ever worn a lab coat for my lab work because it's all gas phase and the gas is just going to go through the lab coat. There's no point. And I work on a computer, so don't have a lab coat for that. You got to get some of those like uh, uh, computer glasses as your safety glasses, right? You know, keep, keep your eyes good. The PPE in movies is not, not great. You know, they're, no. they're like, or, or TV shows, like they're, you know, they're, they're doing lasers. And so they've got laser safety goggles that match the color of the laser they're using, which is the opposite of what you want. Well, it's funny because often science involves sort of mundane materials and the movies they're doing like the most dangerous exotic stuff ever and yet there's not that much protective equipment so i feel like uh especially uc davis it's like the the personal protective equipment it errs on the side of caution rather than not you'd think in these high stress situations where you're turning lambs into goo you'd have better protection than a cotton lab coat yeah or, or a wool lab coat, maybe. Maybe it's made of lamb and like yeah. no protection at all, clearly. There you go. Yeah, it's, it'd be on theme. Um, I don't know, maybe a little distasteful to the lamb that's like right now. I don't know. <laughs> so one movie that we had talked about a little bit is uh, Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe the science or just the impact it's had on you? So that was one I watched as a kid and... It, that actually probably like the the doc brown scientist stereotype you know the crazy guy with wild hair and you know 1.21 gigawatts and great like, scott great yeah that's that's influenced my life i think i was like yeah scientists are pretty cool which i guess kind of probably gives a little hint on how cool i actually am but no it it, it definitely influenced me i looking back on it now i don't I don't know. I go back and forth on there. There are problems in the science for sure, but like you could hand wave some of this stuff around, like you know. It's such a fun adventure, you know. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's just not worth trying to nitpick it at all. It's just, and it, it, it makes science science really seem adventurous and fun, you know. And, um, I think that that's one of like the, the good parts of that movie. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, like Mr. Fusion and the flying cars. That's, that's, that's been my, oh, and the, the self-drying jacket been the dream. Yes. I actually saw um, some, cause you know, I, I, I like, I like following the, the, the maker stuff. So the, you know, 3d printing and like the do it yourself electronics and people making wild and crazy things. I saw somebody who had designed their own self lacing shoes and like they had like an Arduino in there that controlled them and like, you know, motors that would cinch them down for you. And it's like, that's pretty cool. Or how they, they bought a pizza hut pizza and they had a rehydrator for it because it was That's so right. little. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, I need to go back and watch those movies. I think they're on Netflix. PSA, everyone watching Back to the Future movies are on Netflix. You should go watch them because the science is entertaining. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I think you said earlier, I, I kind of mostly suspend my belief when I watch shows and sometimes I just enjoy the really crappy science that shows up in TV shows or movies. I, I talked to Dan and our, our cohort about the, the Arrowverse CW DC superhero TV shows and the science in there is just fantastically awful. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to run really fast around this magnet to recharge it so that, you know, the magnetic or to cancel out its magnetic field or all of these really ridiculous. Was he at least wearing like a copper coil when he did that or what? He wasn't. I mean, I guess maybe he generates electricity and that was what was, you know, you put the, the circular electric field produces magnetic lines, which is true, but like, I'm not so sure about that. It almost feels, and, and I feel like a lot of, movie writers do this maybe just from the movies i've watched but they they've got this like grab bag vocabulary you know they like go scan through scientific articles and pick out words that sound sciencey to them and then put them in a randomizer and pick them out whenever they need to say something sciencey like flux capacitor like, like flux capacitor which is gibberish you know what i remember sitting in college physics learning what flux and capacitance are and i'm like those are not related to each other at all. It doesn't make any sense. So not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Maybe one time we'll be able to use it to jump time streams and go and erase ourselves from existence on accident by making our mom fall in love with us. Oh, spoilers for those of you that haven't seen Back to the Future. Sorry, Kelly, can you put a spoiler tag up on that? Um, That's true. We probably should warn about spoilers, right? <laughs> I mean, like, if, you, if you're watching a show called Scientist Talk Movies, like, you gotta expect it, right? Maybe? That is, so that, that's actually something that I wanted to talk about, Back to the Future, speaking of. So he goes back in time and starts to accidentally erase himself because he stops his dad from meeting his mom and going on the date to the, what was it, Under the Sea Dance? Yeah, the Under the Sea Dance that, you know, they had their first kiss and that's what led to them getting married. But, like... If he gets erased from existence because he does that, wouldn't that stop him from going back and doing that? And then he comes back into existence? I think time travel movies run into all sorts of issues like that when you really start you know, digging into the details. But it's, it's interesting to see the different approaches they take to handling that. Like there's time travel in like the Harry Potter movies. Mm -hmm. and they, they try that a certain way and there's interesting takes all over but yeah i agree it, the, it gets pretty murky when you try and you know rationalize every every right. thing they do and that's why most of the time when i'm especially when i'm watching the movie i just enjoy it and then i start thinking back on it later and i'm like hey wait a second what i don't like though is when movies like make fun of other movies that do that and then also have these glaring paradoxes in their own treatment of time travel did you see uh in game adventures in game marshall yes so like you know they there's like this scene where they're just making fun of all of these time travel movies and they're like yeah we're not like that we we're actually doing it the right way and then they have their own issues with time travel and they don't follow their own rules and it's like that's when it kind of bugs me when the movie is trying to take itself seriously and like is portraying itself as like, this is real science. And then it's not real science. I, th I think that's why I can laugh at the, the DC ones is because they very clearly are not taking themselves seriously and they're not even trying to do science correctly. They're just trying to sound sciencey. Yeah. 
yeah so this i mean this was fun i enjoyed talking about this with you marshall so thanks for coming in and listening to us talk about movies guys stay tuned for the next episode bye